I'm Ben Micellis from the Midas Touch Network. So after Clarence Thomas granted uh, a temporary stay of the enforcement of the subpoena for Lindsey Graham to uh, have to testify in front of the Fulton County Special Grand Jury, and it's a temporary stay. As I mentioned on the other video, it is pending the Fulton County Grand Jury submitting its brief, which will take place on October 27th. But nonetheless, Clarence Thomas got involved. And after he did that, many people asked, well, why is Clarence Thomas even getting involved in the first place, number one? And number two, should he recuse himself? And so the answer is he should absolutely recuse himself. And by not recusing himself, I believe he is violating a statute, 48 U.S.C., 455, and I will read for you what that statute says. He's also, I believe, violating the due process clause of the United States Constitution. I will go over that analysis with you here. Um, but to answer the first question, why is he involved? I talked about this at length in other videos, so I'll just explain it briefly here, that the Supreme Court justices are each assigned to supervise an uh, appellate court and different circuit courts. And so, so Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas supervises emergency applications for the 11th Circuit. And then you have other justices supervise other courts. So like Amy Coney Barrett is the 7th Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, Justice Alito is the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and all the other justices are assigned uh, a specific circuit court by the Chief Justice John Roberts. Okay, now getting into the recusal. Should Clarence Thomas have recused himself? Absolutely. Let's just go into what the law says. U.S. Code 28 U.S.C. 455, disqualification of justice, judge, or magistrate judge. And here's what the law says. A, any justice, judge, or magistrate judge of the United States shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality might be reasonably questioned. So right then and there, would Clarence Thomas's impartiality be reasonably questioned? Yes. And then B, sub B, actually gives specific examples. B, he shall also disqualify himself in the following circumstances. And here it's also written as shall. He shall disqualify himself in the following circumstances. Um, sub one, where he has a personal bias or prejudice concerning a party or personal knowledge of disputed evidentiary facts concerning the proceeding. Well, that may apply. It seems like it, it does, but um, two doesn't apply, three doesn't apply, uh, and now let's go to five. He or his spouse or a person within the third degree of relationship to either of them or the spouse of such a person, sub one, is a party to the proceeding or an officer, director, or trustee of a party, sub two, is acting as a lawyer in the proceeding. That doesn't apply. Sub three is known by the judge to have an interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome of the proceeding. And sub four is to the judge's knowledge likely to be a material witness in the proceeding. So that section clearly applies to the disqualification of Justice Clarence Thomas. You have his spouse, Ginny Thomas, uh, and then sub three is known to have an interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome of this proceeding. And sub four is to the judge's knowledge likely to be a material witness in the proceeding, and Clarence Thomas's wife, Ginny Thomas, was involved in the, fake, in the fake elector slates. We know that. We know that she submitted emails to state legislators telling them that she wanted them to, quote unquote, vote in clean elector slates, which was her word for the fake electors, and to not count the real electors. We also know that Ginny Thomas was sending these messages to Mark Meadows and that she was one of the organizers of the January 6th insurrection. So she was clearly involved. She's clearly a material witness who could be called in this proceeding. Absolutely. So on that basis, um, Clarence Thomas should recuse himself if he follows the law. 
I also want to then, there's another analysis too, outside of just what the law says, and there is a due process analysis of the United States Constitution. And the due process analysis of the United States Constitution most recently has been articulated in a case called Caperton versus A.T. Massey Cole, a 2009 United States Supreme Court case, which addressed the due process concerns that implicate a request for judicial uh, recusal. And in that case, you had uh, justices to the Supreme Court of Appeals, the High Court uh, uh, in West Virginia in 2004. And one of the justices who got appointed there was also heavily involved in uh, the business uh, interests of one of the uh, defendants. In fact, it says, Two years earlier, a jury had returned a verdict against this A.T. Massey call in the amount of $50 million. Massey's chairman contributed more than $3 million in support of a candidate who, if successful, would likely oversee the appeals of that verdict or oversee the appeal of the verdict. The Supreme Court in that case granted certiorari, they heard the case, uh, to address the due process concerns and issues that were raised by the refusal of that judge to recuse themselves in the matter where this significant expenditure was made uh, to support that judge. And one of the things that the Supreme Court held um, was that, uh, quote, determining whether there was an actual bias um, is not actually what you have to do. Instead, what you have to do is look to the uh, objective risk of actual bias that required the justice's recusal. So one of the things the Supreme Court articulated is it was not the justice's own belief, nor even the presence of actual bias which mattered. Instead, what mattered was the objective risk, risk, of actual bias that required the justice's uh, recusal. And that is what is precisely relevant here was the Supreme Court's conclusion that there is a serious risk of actual bias based on objective and reasonable perceptions when a person uh, who has a personal stake or could have a personal stake with their spouse being involved in the matter uh, doesn't recuse themselves. So it's that perception. That's what's being viewed here. So clearly, Clarence Thomas should recuse himself applying the Supreme Court's own standards in the Caperton versus A.T. Massey case, as well as following the law of 28 U.S.C. 455. The one thing, though, that makes this case different than ATT Massey or different than any other setting where a federal judge would have to recuse is how do you appeal a Supreme Court justice's failure to recuse themselves? You can't. They're the highest court. So unlike all these other settings, when Clarence Thomas or any Supreme Court justice, for that matter, doesn't recuse themselves or makes the decision, they don't have to give a justification for not recusing themselves. They don't have to say anything. And you can challenge it because you would normally have to challenge that to the higher court and then eventually to the Supreme Court. And so since the Supreme Court is the highest court, there's no place to challenge it. And that is why... In many ways, the Supreme Court is immune from lots of the, or mostly all of the judicial canons and 28 U.S.C. 455, uh, their own due process jurisprudence, and, and in the case that I just talked about from 2009, which focuses on a lot of other uh, Supreme Court precedent. And so this is one of the reasons why lots of people say, including myself, that there needs to be serious reforms within the Supreme Court so that it can be held accountable. Whether you have other bodies that need to be ones who make decisions for recusal, whether uh, we need other laws to uh, basically automatically govern recusal to make it automatic so that the judges can't decide on their own recusal, so it just happens as a matter of law. There has to be some 
some group, some entity, something that has teeth that actually can enforce 28 U.S.C. 455, um, the due process clause of the Constitution, um, and basic common sense uh, when it comes to these decisions by the Supreme Court. And, you know, we've been seeing over and over again with these insurrection-related cases, with the January 6th-related cases, with Trump-related cases, uh, where these radical right Supreme Court justices should recuse themselves. They don't recuse themselves. And Americans, including myself, um, whether you have a legal degree or not, we're sick and tired of it. Enough of this. You know, we just want a, we just want a court to, you know, and justices to do the right thing. Clarence Thomas should not be hearing this case, period. It's just a simple, it's a simple, simple decision that he needs to make. And we're just sick and tired of this stuff. Um, I'll keep giving you these legal updates, but it's important that you know the body of law here uh, that's at issue. The one other point that I'll make in, in close, though, is that even though Justice Clarence Thomas granted this temporary stay, uh, I wouldn't read too much into it in the sense that the final briefing by uh, the Fulton County is due October 27th. So all Justice Clarence Thomas's order is doing is temporarily stopping the enforcement by the Fulton Grand Jury of the subpoena until such time as the Fulton County District Attorney submits her brief before the Supreme Court. Then there'll be a ruling. Clarence Thomas can rule on that himself, or like he did in the Mar-a-Lago search warrant case, refer the matter to the full Supreme Court for their uh, overall decision on Lindsey Graham's emergency application. So this relief that Clarence Thomas gave in not enforcing the subpoena, as of now, is only like a few day relief. Um, but we will, you know, keep following this up and, and see what he does next. Because, again, I think we all agree Clarence Thomas should not even be involved in this decision in the first place. I'm Ben Micellis from the Midas Touch Network. Hey, hit the subscribe button right now. We're on our way to 1 million subscribers thanks to your support. Also, check out our exclusive content on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Midas Touch. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Midas Touch. We're not funded by any outside millionaires or billionaires. We're fueled empowered purely by you so please check it out it's a good way to help grow this independent media network that's patreon.com slash Midas Touch until next time I'm Ben Micellis Midas Touch is unapologetically pro-democracy and look we know you are too so please make sure you check out our best-selling shirt and our best-selling gear the unapologetically pro-democracy gear and hey while you're at it make sure you check out my favorite shirt and one of our most famous designs it wasn't rigged you're just a loser at store.midastouch.com that's store.midastouch.com.